Welcome to the uh, ICNA ILF Quran webinar series. This week, inshallah, we'll be studying Surah Taha, verses 102 to 111. And today's webinar, inshallah, will be delivered by Dr. Abu Zaid. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. <clears throat> um, I just need to make sure everyone's hearing me and they can see the Mus'haf on the page. Um, can you type your responses here or how is this going to work? Inshallah, it's okay. Please, okay. you can proceed. Okay. I will be lying in a shaitan or a dream. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa salatu wa ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een amma ba'd. So today we're going to be looking at <clears throat> a very moving passage from Surah Baha. Um, the passage is actually on the screen. It's the entire page of this Mus'haf. I think the number of the verses that was given to you might be slightly off, uh, but the passage actually starts from verse number 99 and will end at verse number 112, so 99 through 112. So this is a passage I selected for many reasons. Um, I think <clears throat> it's, a, it's a wonderful illustration of the Quranic uh, technique of um, teaching you so much and giving so much by the way of reminder and lessons but through um, through imagery and through very effective uh, usage of of events and of images so <clears throat> to to begin with um, I'm going to go back to the beginning of the surah just to put this passage in perspective this is the second major portion of the surah, verse 99. Um, to understand that, we have to go to page one, so the first beginning of the surah. So I'll go back to verse number one, and we'll zoom into this page here. So Surah Taha is an early Meccan surah, and it touches on uh, the basic theme of the Quran being guidance uh, as offered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his prophets. So from the very beginning, Allah says, Taha, a'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem, bismillahir rahmanir rahim, Taha, ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'ana li tashqa. So the first thing Allah says, verse number one, after saying Taha, <clears throat> which is an opener, we have not revealed uh, this Qur'an unto you, and who's you here? Obviously, um, the Qur'an is addressed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. When it uses the singular alayka, right, we have now revealed unto you singular, then there's a stronger indication that um, the addressee is the Prophet wasallam, and by extension, all of us. So the very first thing Allah says is, um, we have not revealed the Quran unto you in order to make you distressed, in order to make you or put you into difficulty. And then the second verse, <laughs> we have only sent it to you as tadhkira, as a reminder or an admonition for those who would take heed. And then Allah describes the revelation. But this is what I want to start with. So the very first thing, this Quran is revealed unto the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, not to cause any trouble or hardship, but only to be, to serve as a tadhkira. Or dhikra. So this is the central theme of this surah. This um, that the Quran is dhikr. It's a reminder. It's admonition. It's a uh, guidance. And then Allah just continues to describe that guidance. We go. We go down this page. Um, and then, and the verse ends with verse eight. This passage ends. Allahu la ilaha illahu lahu al husna. Allah, no being worthy of worship but he and he has the best and most beautiful names 
And then Allah begins a section that goes on to surah to verse number 99. So verse 9 through 99, it begins, وَحَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى Have you heard the story of Musa? So 9 through 99, almost 100 verses, Allah will share uh, in detail the story of Musa So the very opening of the surah is the theme of guidance. The Quran is a tazkira. Then Allah immediately goes into the story of Musa and it's in quite a uh, detail, a bit of detail. And then now we go back to, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back to the passage that we're looking at. So our passage begins right where the story of Musa ends. So it's verse number 99. Okay, so after Allah finishes the story of Musa, he comes back in verse 99, he says, min ima qad sabaqo, wa qad min ladunna dhikra. <clears throat> so Allah says that we have revealed these stories to you from the events of what transpired in the past. Okay. وَقَدْ أَتَيْنَاكَ مِنْ لَدُنَّا And we have given you from ourselves dhikra. So, going back to what I started with, the very first uh, portion of this surah, Allah reminds us that this is going to be, the Quran is a reminder. And then he gives us, he goes into the past and brings out the story of Musa. And then when that story is, Finish. Now he comes back to this main theme, and now the Quran, the surah is continuing the theme of the Quran being dhikr, and he's reminding us that this is a dhikra. <clears throat> and then he says, "Man a'rad anhu fa innahu yahmilu yawm al qiyamati wizra." Before I go there, just wanted to pause and reflect on this idea of dhikr. You have knowledge and you have information, but then you have a higher level which is called dhikr. So Allah didn't say in the beginning and here, he didn't use the word ilm, although that word is used in the Quran quite often. Um, when you say ilm, um, it means knowledge. It could also be translated as information. Um, it's information or it's knowledge that's there, whether you benefit from it or not. But more often than that, when Allah describes the Quran, the term that's used is very different. The term that's used is dhikr. Or tazkira. In the beginning of the surah, Allah says tazkira. Here he says dhikra. Sometimes he says dhikrun. Um, it's various forms, but it's the same word. It comes from the word dhakara, which means to remember Allah. So dhikr, just think for a moment how dhikr is different from knowledge. Reminder or admonition, um, however you want to translate this, um, is, is, is very different from knowledge. Because knowledge is purely rational. Knowledge is something that perhaps you can prove or is information. Um, you can have mathematics and call it knowledge. You can have a set of facts and dates and call it ilm or knowledge. But when you say dhikr, it's not just facts. It's not just information. Uh, dhikr is, uh, it has a sense of being connected to the heart, a sense of uh, a person's soul being transformed or um, it has a sense of heeding the call sense of admonition, sense of guidance, as that sense there that knowledge does not necessarily have. So the important point here is the Quran is actually dhikr. It's not a book of information. It's not a book that you can prove. I know many of us are into da'wah these days, and there's so much talk and so many videos about proving the, the truth of the Quran, proving this, proving that. Um, that's not really the style of the Quran. The Quran style is dhikr. Dhikr is a conversation that happens with your heart. Um, the Quran appeals to our fitra, our innate nature. It appears to our emotion. It also brings facts, but that's not the main focus of the Quran. So this whole passage and, and the entire Quran, in fact, is dhikr. And we'll look at this passage, how moving it is, and how Allah teaches us some very fundamental lessons by way of dhikr, not by way of information or knowledge or proof. Okay, so the passage actually begins. So Allah says, "Man a'rada anhu, fa innahu yahmilu yawm al-qiyamati wizra." 
So after sharing the story of Musa and the believers and Fir'aun and the disbelievers and the clash between Haq and Batil um, and so on and so forth, um, now, so that's the past. Now this passage is about the future. It's about the day of judgment. So the Quran often um, goes into the past and it often goes into the future. And sometimes uh, it talks about the present circumstances. So these are the three tenses used in the Quran. Um, there's a lot of past events. You can say one third of the Quran is qasas or history or stories from the past. But a lot of the Quran is also going into the future, telling about telling us about uh, things that will happen in the future, telling us about the day of judgment, telling us about prediction, telling us about the end of the world. So this is all in the future. And then a lot of the verses or many of the verses are focused on the present, telling us to wake up, telling us to be reminded, telling us to pray, telling us to give charity and so on and so forth. But the common denominator in all of that, whether the Quran speaks about the past, whether the Quran speaks about the future, there's always a purpose to it. It's not just to relay information or history, but it's dhikr. It's for us to wake up. It's for us to take heed, uh, to, for us to be admonished and advised. So. Here he says, after this whole, um, the story of Musa, he says, anyone who turns away from it, the guidance, the dhikr, he will carry a heavy burden on the day of judgment. So now this is the day of judgment. He's talking about the future. A day where they shall, at that time, there's they, they will live there in forever, um, and they will abide this burden forever. You know, yeah, uh, what an evil burden that will be. So those who reject, this is talking about, so now the Quran speaking about the future day of judgment, but specifically focusing on those who rejected the message. So what an evil and heavy burden they shall be carrying on that day. And it will be forever. And then Allah brings, now this is where the imagery starts. يَوْمَ يُنْفَخُ فِي الصُّورِ Allah says, on that day, the trumpet shall be sounded. And we shall gather the mujrimin, the criminals, on that day, and they shall be zurqa. So, we want to pause for a moment and reflect here. So, the trumpet is being sounded. That's a very powerful image. Huge trumpet being sounded the day of resurrection at hand. And nahshur, nahshur means to resurrect. So Allah says we resurrect, we will resurrect. Who are they resurrecting? Who is Allah focusing on? Actually, everyone will be resurrected. But here the focus is on the mujrimin, criminals. So again, tying it with the previous passage, story of Musa and Fir'aun. Now it's talking about the end of people like Fir'aun and those who followed him. And those who sinned, those who rejected the message are called in this passage criminals, mujrimin. Because that's really what they are when you reject the clear signs of Allah, when you oppose uh, the truth and you follow falsehood and you're involved in all sorts of injustice. Um, then on that day, they shall be branded as criminals, mujrimin. But then Allah says we shall resurrect the mujrimin on that day. And he uses a very uh, strange expression, zurqa. Azraq in, in Arabic is blue. So literally it means we shall resurrect the mujrimin uh, and they will be blue or blue-faced. Um, so English translations, they, they translate this in various ways. This particular one that I'm looking at, it says, turn their eyes turn blue with terror. So the mujrimin will be raised and their eyes are blue with terror. Um, but most translations, they say um, blue-faced or pale-faced from terror. Now, it's very interesting. Everything Allah uses, there's a, there's a point to it. It makes perfect sense. So when Allah uses a color here, there has to be some wisdom behind that. And actually, when you when you so the the state of the the criminals on that day will be a state of shock and awe. It's a state of shock and awe. Generally, when you receive bad news, and if you think about you know your own circumstances, when someone receives horrible news of a tragedy, you know they lose the color in their face. Their face turns pale, and it's closer to blue. When you look at, um, I'm a medical doctor, when you look at uh, someone who died, um, a cadaver or a dead body, their face generally is blue because the, the blood is no longer 
circulating um, you know, throughout the body. So blue is the color of terror. Blue is the color of where the blood goes away from your face. So Allah is painting a very vivid image of this shock and awe state on that day of the criminals. They'll be waking up from their slumber and they will be pale faced and blue. Um, contrast that with someone who's full of life. The opposite of blue in this context is red. So someone who's full of life and energetic, his face is red. And often uh, in Arabic, uh, red face is an expression. For instance, uh, the Prophet ﷺ would describe his beloved wife, Aisha radiallahu anha, as Humaira. Her name was Humaira from red, red is Ahmar in Arabic. Um, so she was full of life, her face was vibrant. Um, so he used to call her a nickname, red faced. So Humaira, and it's actually a popular name in the Muslim world, is the opposite of Zurqa, right? So Zurqa is the stark opposite of Humaira. Humaira, red faced, full of life, energy, vibrant. Zurqa, pale, shock state, a state of horror, um, state of, of, of death, okay? And then Allah says, They shall be whispering to one another, whispering to one another. So there will be some conversations happening on that day. It's not a day um, where there's no interaction. There is some interaction, and we know we have many uh, indications of that in the Quran and in, in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu um, Alaihi Wasallam. Allah here is recalling one sort of that conversation. So they shall be these criminals, and these criminals, think of them in this world, they were arrogant, they were unjust. There, they shall be pale-faced in horror. And when they speak to one another, Allah said, yet the khafatun, and they'll be whispering. They'll be so terrified that they would not be able to raise their voices. So they'll be whispering to one another, what will they be saying? What's the conversation? Illa biftum, illa ashra. They will say, you know what? Um, we we were on we were living in, in in the earth only for about ten days. Ashra is ten. So they're reflecting on their you know it's like a dream the world that they were living in their their hayat dunya their life in this world. And some of them would be saying it seemed like it was only about ten days. Then Allah says Nahnu a'lamu bima yaqulun. We know better what they are saying. If yaqulu amthaluhum tariqatan illa bithum illa yawma. And Allah is continuing to share that conversation. He's saying, um, we, we know very well what they will say to one another. The best estimates are those who are the smartest among them. Amthaluhum tariqatan. They will actually say, you know what? No, it wasn't even 10 days. It was no more than a day. So the smartest ones will hit the, you know, will, will, will be absolutely on point when they say you only lived on the earth for a day. And really, when you look at your life, when you look at the past, time is something very, very uh, fickle, very interesting. You know, we have nothing. Uh, Hassan al-Basri said, Yabna Adam, O son of man, innama anta ayyam. All you are are a bunch of days. So human beings, all we have are a bunch of days. At the end of the day, that's all we have. We have the past, we have the present, we have the future. Um, so he said, as for the past, that's part a part of you is gone forever. As for the future, it's not here yet. So live for the present. So really, when you look at life and you look at when you look in the past, when you look first of all, when you look in the future, you have this illusion that you have lots of time. So human beings, we tend to procrastinate. We're like, you know what? We have a whole semester to finish this. Uh, you know, you're in college, for instance, or school, and there's exams, you have to write a paper. Oh, I have a whole month to do this. Seems like endless time, and you postpone it. When you look to the future, oh, I have many years to repent. I have many years to get my life straight. Um, so it looks like you have forever. But when you look in the past, and everyone can reflect on that, when you look in the past, it seems like it went by so fast. No one knows where their childhood went. Those who are in their 40s, they look back. Just yesterday, they were in college. Those who were in their 50s and 60s, the same situation. They don't know where their life has gone. Uh, you speak to someone who is in the 80s. There's so many people um, 
when I ask uh, someone who's in the 80s and 90s to reflect on life, almost invariably they say the same thing. We don't know where all these years went. So when you look in the past, it's almost nothing. But when you look in the future, you have the illusion of lots of time. So Allah says in the Quran, again and again, he, um, there's so many situations where people were raised, and this is the same sentiment they'll be having. Um, for instance, the, the, in Surah Al-Baqarah, فَأَمَاتَهُ اللَّهُ مِئَةَ عَامٍ ثُمَّ بَعَثَ Allah made someone die for a hundred years and raised him up. قَالَ كَمْ لَبِثْتَ Allah will ask them, or ask him, how long were you gone? He said, لَبِثْتُ يَوْمًا أَوْ بَعْضَ يَوْمٍ Maybe I was, I was asleep for a day or part of a day. And then Allah said, بَلْ لَبِثْتَ مِئَةَ عَامٍ you, Rather, you were asleep for a hundred uh, years. Same thing with the people of the cave. When they woke up, they went to sleep for 300 years. Um, when they woke up, they thought it was time for dinner. They thought it was just, they went to sleep in the morning, and when they woke up, it's time for dinner. Then Allah uh, reminds them, look at your, your, your donkey, look at the food that you had, to remind them um, what really uh, is going on. So, so then Allah says, and I'll, I'll wrap it up, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْجِبَالِ فَقُلْ يَنْسِفُهَا رَبِّي نَسْفَى فَيَذَرُهَا قَاعًا صَفْصَفًا لَا تَرَى فِيهَا عِوَجًا وَلَا أَمْتَى They ask you about the mountains. Say, Allah will scatter them like dust and level the whole field. You will not find any nook or cranny, no hill or no valley. So, first he's talking about the mujrimin and their state. Now he's talking about the mountains. And sometimes, you know, people comment, this, is, this seems like it's random. Allah is talking about guidance, then the story of Musa. Now it's the day of judgment. And first he's talking about the Mujrimin. Now he's talking about the Jibal, the mountains. But there's nothing random. It all makes perfect sense. So Allah on the day of judgment, he's trying to teach us a lesson of humility, a lesson of Allah's power and how we should be in front of, in the presence of God. So if he brings up among the human beings, the most arrogant ones were the Mujrimin. And among Allah's creation, the mightiest form of creation are the mountain ranges. The biggest thing that we see in our life when we look around are the huge mountains and they're so powerful and formidable. And so Allah says on that day, even from the creation, the mountains, Allah shall you know, level them and the whole earth will be a flat plain. And then after Allah, so Allah brings up the mujrimin, he levels the mountains and then yawma idhin yattabi'una dariya. So on that day, everyone will be following the caller, the dari, without any deviation. So on that day, there will be a dari. Dari is someone who calls, someone who gives dawah. Just like when we give dawah, we call that person a dari. Allah calls the Prophet dariyan in Allah bi idnihi. He's a caller to Allah. On the day of judgment, there shall be a caller gathering everyone, telling them where to go. And every single person will be yattabi'una da'iya, will be following that caller. La iwajala, without any deviation. So Allah is teaching us less, even the criminals, the mountains, they have no choice but to submit uh, in the present, humbly in the presence of God. And then, wa khasha'ati aswatu lil rahman. This is the most powerful portion of this passage. And uh, we'll, we'll end with this. وَخَشَعَتِ الْأَصْوَاتُ لِلرَّحْمَانِ فَلَا تَسْمَعُ إِلَّا حَمْسَ So just pause for a moment and think about what Allah is saying in the imagery. All of creation leveled. Uh, the mightiest mountains crumbled. Everything is totally flat. The mightiest criminals in this world, they can't even, they don't have the audacity to raise their voice. All human beings following the caller, no one dares take a step to the right or the left. They're all following where they're supposed to go. And then Allah draws a sweeping image. All the voices will be hushed on that day. Khushur is the term when we say you have to have khushur in prayer, you know, which is humility or silence. Or but This is the state. All the voices will be hushed before the merciful one, Ar-Rahman. They shall be hushed. And you will hear, فَلَا تَسْمَعُ You will hear nothing but a whisper, إِلَّا hamsa. Hamsa is the deafening sound of silence. So hams in Arabic 
it's a Tajweed term also. I teach Tajweed. Hums is like the, the sound that comes with the S. When you say S, that sound coming from the letter S or seen is called hums. So on that day, there will be deafening silence. You'll hear the sound of silence. It will be that deafening sound, that hissing sound, that murmur. No one dares raise their voice. So this is the state of creation before Allah Azza wa Jal. So Allah is teaching us this is a dhikr. Dhikr means there has to be a point to this passage. There has to be a point. The point here is you want to know what khushu is. You want to know how to submit to Allah Azza wa Jal in this world. In the next world, you have no choice. Allah is painting you for you an image in the next world what submission is. Even the mujrimin, even the mountain. This is what submission means. Submission or being a Muslim means you humble yourself before the awesome power of Allah Azza wa Jal. And you don't dare take a step without his permission. And that's how we shall be on the day of judgment. And that's how we're supposed to be in this world. In this world, we should take this final portion as a as a as a reminder. All the voices should be hushed, should be humble, subdued before our Rahman. And no one should hear any deviation from that. If you want to know how to have khushu in your prayers, this is the best verse. You want to know how to pray, what khushu in prayer means, what that concentration, focus in prayer in salah means. This is what it means. Khasha'atil aswatul rahman Subdue your voices, subdue your heart before the awesome power of Allah Azza wa Jal, who is Rahman, full of mercy. And let no one hear uh, anything but um, silence and complete obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal. Um, so this is the end of the passage. With that, I'll end. Uh, just a brief reminder um, from this great surah, Surah Taha. And I think uh, um, this is my first time doing this, but I think there should be some time or question and answers. Jazakallah khair, uh, Dr. Hussain. So inshallah, we'll uh, move to the Q&A session now. So as usual, uh, please submit your questions uh, through the questions tab within the webinar. And inshallah, I'll uh, cluster things together. So inshallah, the first question. Um, so we've learned in these verses about the life of this world being likened to a single day. Yet when we live our life, it feels so long. And you talked a little bit about some of the people that you've spoken to that are in their 80s and 90s that feel the years have passed by so quickly. What should we do in terms of our daily activities to better appreciate this concept that the life of this world is likened to a single day. You know, what practices do you advise the Muslims to implement daily uh, so that we can remember this concept? So that's a great question. Um, it touches on the concept of time in Islam and time management. Um, so time is one of those things um, that's very, it's, it, it has, has an uh, illusion, a quality of illusion to it. There's an illusion effect um, where you look in the look forward and you look backwards. It's not the same. Um, and then in present, I mean, what do you have in the present? Time is passing by so fast. Every moment when you think about it, the moment passes and seconds go into minutes, and they just it's a continuous march. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in the, He gives us many. Uh, uh, many techniques and many ways. Uh, most important thing is to be conscious of the sh the the finite nature of life and how short it is, and that we can't take any moment for granted. Um, when you have that, it increases the urgency of what you need to be doing. Um, so part of part of managing the time is to call Allah is the creative time. Um, actually, the the best image for time is uh, Imam Razi in his tafsir. He talks about. Um, he learned what time means from, he was one day in the in the market and he saw an ice cellar. And this is hundreds of years ago before electricity, before refrigerators. People used to sell ice. And ice in the market, um, you cover it up, but it melts away and it goes away rapidly. So the person is trying to sell his ice, his block of ice. When I was younger, I've seen that in, in, in villages in Pakistan. 
younger people can appreciate that, but we would go out to the market and there would be big slabs of ice and you would break off a piece of bison. But it melts. It's gone in, in, in a couple of hours or even less than that if it's hotter. So that's really what time is. It's melting so fast and you have to take advantage of it. So how do you take advantage of it? One of the things is when you wake up, a lot gives us uh, lessons in productivity. Um, we always start everything with the name of Allah. So what's the secret behind that? The, the reason and the wisdom behind that is um, you call upon Allah for barakah, for health, for sustenance. So when we wake up, for instance, a beautiful um, prayer. There are prayers. You can say Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. But always start your day by remembering Allah, calling upon Him. Um, so you say, for instance, there's a beautiful prayer. Asbahna wa asbah al-mulku lillahi. Allahumma inni as'aluka khayra hadha al-yawm. Fathahu wa nurahu wa hudahu wa barakatahu. So you say, I woke up and the whole kingdom wakes up before Allah Azza wa Jad. Oh Allah, give me uh, the victories, uh, the blessings, and the openings and the light of this day. Whatever is, uh, whatever good there is in this day, open it up for me. So this is the first thing that should come out of your mouth when you wake up in the morning. When you wake up like that, and also the Fajr prayer, that's a reminder. Allah makes us wake up and remember him to start our day right. When you connect with Allah at the beginning of the day, then your day becomes much more productive and Allah gives you barakah in your time. Um, and not only beginning of the day, Allah gave you the five prayers. So every um, few moments, you know, this, before the sun rises, you get up. Um, when the sun passes the zenith, you have to pray again. Then the sun declines at the midday or the end of the day, you pray again. And then when the sun sets, you have to stop what you're doing and, and turn to Allah again. And before you sleep during the night, you turn to Allah again. So this is Allah's way of teaching us how to take advantage of time. Keep linking ourselves with Allah, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal um, at every moment of the day. So we keep uh, reminding ourselves that uh, of what we're doing and what our purpose is. Allahu Ta'ala. Jazakallah, Karen. It's a very, very good advice. Inshallah, the next question is um, about kushuin prayers, and um, you talked about the silence on the Day of Judgment, and remembering this silence is an important way to try and bring more kushu in the prayers. Can you review some other ways in which we can bring more kushu in our prayers? Okay, so this silence is... Uh... Well, the khushu and the prayers is, is a deep topic, uh, but um, just in a few moments, um, I will say, first of all, there's, a, there's a, an apt expression um, that says, uh, fake it until you make it, right? And that's really the essence of the matter in prayer. We're not always going to be in the best state of Iman. Sometimes we're in rush and, we're, uh, and sometimes we're not feeling it. So prayer is one of the things we have to pray. There's nothing that, you know, if you're not feeling it, if you're not focusing, um, we're allowed not to pray. No, we always have to pray. So we keep trying our best. And um, so the prayer, um, the day of judgment, how that fits in is why will everything be silent on that day? Because people realize the awesomeness and the power of Allah. And uh, when you realize that in this life, there's no way you can't have khushur. So the best way to build khushu is to focus on the, the grandness and the power and the majesty of God. Um, the more you have that realization, the more khushu you will have in your prayer. So rather than focusing on the deed itself, the deed is just, you know, it's five units or four units and takes five minutes or ten minutes or, or longer or less. There's certain things you have to say. That's not what you should be focusing on. You should be focusing on who you're standing before. So... There's a there's a, f a famous uh, early Muslim. Um, he was asked, "How do you pray so good? Like, what do you what do you do?" So this is just an example. I mean, everyone doesn't have to do it, but just to give you an idea uh, what this means. He says, "When every time I pray, I uh, imagine that I'm standing on the Sirat, the the bridge that we will have to pass on the Day of Judgment, and I imagine paradise in front of me, and I imagine the hellfire behind me." And I imagine the angels on my right and my left. Um, so when that's the imagery in your mind of the urgency of where you are and uh, where you're standing in front of, that's really drives the point home and makes you have more focus in your prayer. 
people. Always bring it back to Allah and His power and His names and His attributes and His tawheed. Um, that's one of the ways to increase the khushu in your prayer. Jazakallah, Karen. The next question is um, about the timing and the context of when this surah was revealed. Can you clarify what was the occasion of the revelation and the context around the verses that were revealed? So there's some debate about um, when exactly the surah was revealed. I mean, um, in Tafim al-Quran, um, that's my go-to source. Um, um, this is an early Meccan surah. So the proof for that is, uh, I mean, we don't know exactly. So um, one of the things about occasions of revelation is um, this is an overemphasized uh, field in Muslim scholarship, like why every surah was revealed. Um, the bottom line is, as great scholars like Shah Waliullah said, it doesn't matter. The Quran is universal. It's for me and you. Every surah speaks to us. So when you contextualize the surahs too much, over contextualize, then you decrease the universality of the message. So all we know is that it's an early Makkan surah. Um, we know some of the things like the disbelievers were asking um, when the Prophet was preaching about the Day of Judgment, they would say, you know, in Makkah, I surrounded my mountains, right? So they would say, these mountains, are they going to go away? And that's where, so this is where Allah said, وَيَسْأَلُونَ كَعَنِ الْجِبَالِ um, And we also know the story of the conversion of Umar ibn al-Khattab, um, that, you know, when he went into his sister's house, and he initially intended to kill the Prophet wasallam, he found her reciting what? Surah Taha. So it was being recited very early on. Uh, in early Makkah, so this is one of the proofs that it's early Makkah. But exactly what year and what event doesn't have an event behind it. Uh, it's one of those early Makkah surahs that lay down some fundamentals and basic uh, morality and guidance, day of judgment, story of Musa, and so on and so forth. Okay, the next question, inshallah. Um, in the verse where the criminals having this blue face is mentioned after the, the horn is blown. What is the definition of crim, criminal in this context? Does it refer also to Muslims? Okay, so it's a good question. Um, um, so the context here is, uh, if you look at the, the previous passage, everything is connected in the Quran. So to answer that, like you'd have to go to the passage right before it. Um, and see what Allah is, who is Allah is talking about. So the passage before is most the epic battle between Musa and Fir'aun. So Musa was a believer, he was a prophet. Fir'aun was an absolute disbeliever. He was an oppressor, he was a tyrant. Um, so this is the story, how the, that story ends. Um, so immediate, the immediate, um, so Allah used the word criminal. But the thing is, here's the thing, like the, the so, immediately refers to people who rejected Allah. And that's what uh, criminality is, like those who did not recognize their creator. That's the worst crime. So Allah says, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنِ افْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا Who is more unjust than the one who invents a lie about Allah or rejects Allah and brings partners to Allah. So the greatest crime, um, and it's a crime, so the greatest crime in Islam is shirk. Those who associate partners to Allah and don't recognize his rights. Um, so that's that's what it's really referring to. Now, who else falls under that? Um, Allahu alam. So, I mean, there are Muslims who are Muslims by name, and they may not really have faith. And there, there are many these days. Um, you have atheist Muslims. You have Muslims that um, do everything in their power to fight Islam. Um, but in this life, we can't make judgments on any group of people or any. Um, there's nothing in the Quran that teaches us all the Muslims will be on one side, all the non-Muslims will be on one side. It's not about identities. On that day, it's about faith. And that faith on that day is very different from faith in this life. So on that day, you will realize who are the mujrimin and who are not. So you might be surprised to find some faces in this camp that you thought were believers um, because... All the verses about hellfire and the verses of debt, judgment day, and the, um, they talk about um, you know people who commit these crimes or people who believe in certain things or disbelieve in certain things. 
doesn't talk about groups as identities. You know, the Messiahim, the Christians, or the Jews, or um, so Allah only Allah knows the full answer, but Allah gives us the general guidelines. That general guideline, if you reject Allah as a you are a criminal. Allah. Okay, Jazakallah Kara. So with that, we will end the session as, as, as time is out. So I'd like to thank Dr. Abu Zaid for a great presentation and the Q&A, mashallah. We will resume our Quran series next week, same time, 9 p.m. Eastern time. Jazakallah Kara. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu Allah ilaha illa ant. Astaghfirullah wa atubu alik. Awudu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wa al asr inna al insana la fi khus illa al ladina amanu wa amilu as sanihat wa tawassaw bil haq wa tawassaw bis sabr sadaqallahu alazim assalamu alaykum wa alaykum assalam